Hello everybody. My name is Eric D. Jones, also known by Shell. Live right here in the city of Memphis, state of Tennessee, within the county shed. Today is date, early Monday morning, February the 15th, 2016, time 1.45 a.m. Thank you. First say thank to all my fans, my support for the team, encouragement and support. I'm continuing to keep myself employed right here in the city of Memphis in this tri-state area. And I'll continue to further my education at one more kind of online pursuing my social media study business and straight concentration mark. Just a strange mess. And on today if you uh, uh, in the background, uh, you hear the music, uh, that's the African uh that's this is Africa.me dot com uh, newspaper, online newspaper. And they have a uh, radio station, they have a uh, hit radio, get up radio, and they have the classic radio station. So right now, that's the classic radio station that you're hearing. I'm going to turn it down. <coughs> For today's video, we're going to continue to talk about African traditional religion, which is being taught in institutions in higher learning, colleges and universities throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. You can get your bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD in African traditional religion. Now on yesterday on my previous video, we went into some uh we, we, we went to the uh, King James version of the Bible. We went to the book of Moses called the book of uh, Genesis, which is, uh, I guess you call it one of those uh, stories that uh, people have been telling for many generations. And uh, it was written down by a person named uh, Moses. And uh, you know, the story uh, tell, uh, it tells about you know, uh, how supposedly everything came into a being. So, uh, over today in the video, uh, I stopped on chapter uh, 15. Now, in yesterday's video, we stopped in uh, chapter 3. Right. And uh, right, okay. So what I'm gonna do today, is we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do chapter four. We're gonna go to chapter four and uh I'm gonna stop at chapter five for a reason. Uh we're gonna do we're gonna go to chapter four, we're gonna go to chapter five. But I'm gonna I'm gonna try not to go past chapter five for a reason. On yesterday's video, we talked about these stories, and uh, I don't want to spend all I don't want to spend all the time on that. What I want to do is refer to uh, Dr. Avon Leahy's uh, book that he co-wrote with uh, with uh, with Dr. Hall. Uh, with the
with Dr. DePaymo. DePaymo, he co-wrote with Dr. DePaymo. But I also want to refer to uh, Dr. Uh, M. Beatty's book also about these creation stories. Because we want to make sure that everyone, that everybody that's listening understands this. And when we be talking about African traditional religion, and when you hear this story that's being told in the uh, King James Bible, and also uh, in the Quran, that this story is not something that should have you so that you think that you're supposed to live by this, and that you're supposed to, this is the truth and things is that. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna refer to Dr. Embiid's book, and we're gonna refer to Dr. Uh, Ava Leilu's book that he co-wrote with Dr. The Payment and some other books as well. It's a possibility I might be able to uh, refer to another book, uh, some of the other books as well, but that's the reason why. So right now, we're going to go ahead and get to uh, the King James Version of the Bible. In the Old Testament, we, we, we're going to uh, the book of Genesis, and we're going to start at chapter 4. Chapter 4. We're going to go through chapter 4, and we're going to go through chapter 5, then we're going to stop there, and we're going to resume next video in uh out of there because we want to get to that part as well six as well but but today we want to get to uh dr a one book that he co-wrote with dr the payment and we want to also get to uh, uh dr m Beatty's book about these stories so let's get let's go to it Now, we're in the King James Version of the Bible. <coughs> Had to just my church. Okay. Chapter 4, it says in chapter 4, and Adam, now we have to remember that the pronunciation, we know that this is Afro-Asian. And anybody that know that, that's what you read in this book. This is Afro-Asian, the King James Version of the Bible, when it said the book of Moses. This is Afro-Asian. This their language, their culture, and their customs. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Like I said, when you read, you have to remember that my ancestor, Nigel Congo, what you read is Afro-Asiatic. This is Afro-Asiatic culture and their customs. So this is the reason why when they talk the way they talk, to, you know, uh, we don't talk. You know. It's not Niger Congo culture. And it's not Niger Congo customs at all. And she again buried his brother, Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep. A cane was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground and offered unto to the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstness of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wrong? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire. And thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass. But they were in the field, and Cain rose up against his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not, am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? 
the voice of thy brother's blood cried unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day. This day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that everyone that found me shall slay, shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, Whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord sent a mark upon Cain, that any finding him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. And unto Enoch was born Arad, and Arad begat Mehujael, and Mehujael begat Methuselah, and Methuselah begat Lamech, and Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other was Zillah. And Ada bare Jabal, he was the father such as dwell in tents, and as such as have cattle. And his brother's name was Jubal. He was father of all such as handled the sharp, the heart, and organ. And Zillah, she also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every art, artificer in brass and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Naame. <coughs> and Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wild of Lamech. Hearken. He said, Hearken unto my speech. For I have slain a man to my wounded, and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be a being sevenfold, truly Lamech, seventy and sevenfold, and Adam knew his wife again. And she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God said, She hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son. And he called his name Enos. Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. So we're going to go to chapter 5. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man in the likeness of God, made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And Adam lived a hundred and thirty years and begat his son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. And Seth lived 105 years and begat Enos. And Seth lived after he begat Enos 800 and seven years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. And Enos lived 93, uh, 90, and Enos lived 90 years and begat uh, Kainan. And Enos lived, after he begat Kainan, 815 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enos were 905 years, and he died. And Canaan lived 70 years and begat Mahalalel. 
and can they live after he begot? May her love be ill 840 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Canaan were 910 years and he died. And Mahalalel lived 65 years and begat Jared. And Mahalalel lived after he begat Jared 830 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years and he died. And Jared lived 162 years, and he begat Enoch. And Jared lived after he begat Enoch 800 years, and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. And Enoch lived 65 years, and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years, and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, but God took him. And Methuselah lived in 187 years and begat Lamech. And Methuselah lived after he begat Lamech 782 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. And Lamech lived 182 years and begat a son. And he called his name Noah. And called his name Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil over our hand, because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. And Lamech lived after he begat Noah 595 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Lamech were 770 and 7 years, and he died. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And we're going to start right there. <coughs> we just got to read from the uh, King James Bible, King James Version of the Holy Bible. As they call it, Holy Bible, in the book of, uh, what they call it? the first book of Moses, Genesis. We read chapters 4 and 5, and we stopped at chapter 6 in Mark. Uh, Now we're going to refer to uh, Dr. Ava Leilu, uh Dr. Joseph Ava, I'm going to say Ava Leilu's book that he co-wrote with Dr. DePaymo on uh, West African traditional religion. Okay, it says here, we're going to chapter 3, God and the world, in our, uh, uh, section 3, 1, West African creation story. We're going to start with the Yaruba. We're not going to go the whole page 54. And we're going to start at, uh, it says, three, no, three, one, West African creation stories. 
we have already seen that some of West African names of God as well as his attributes show God as creator. People everywhere believe that the world was created by God. But as for God's how the creation of the universe and everything therein took place, there is no general agreement. However, each people had one story or the other of how the side of the universe came into existence. Some of these stories are put in systemic orderly narration, while there are those which are disjointed and verge on absurdity. But when they are pieced together, one will find that they all point rather conclusively to a creator God. Whatever exists owes its existence to the supreme deity. Whatever happens is due to his creative activity. Thus, creation is the most widely acknowledged work of God throughout West Africa. Let us now successfully examine some of the most important creation stories. A. Among the Yoruba. The Yoruba cosmogony has been loosely narrated by Idol. And all that we shall do here is to summarize it. The Yoruba have it that in the timeless beginning or timeless prehistory, there was Oludumari, the supreme deity, and with him in the sky, in the sky heaven, lived the numerous divinities. Among them were Obise, Inle, also called Obatale, the arch divinity, and deputy of Oludumari in the ordering of things, Urumile, also called Aife, the deputy of Oludumare in matters of knowledge, and Isu, the inspector of rituals. Far below the sky, heaven, there was a watery marshy waste, an endless stretch of water, and wild marshes. Over this vast expanse of water, Odukan, the god of the sea, ruled, but the divinities in the sky, heaven, usually came down from the wild marsh to perform their hunting activity. They descended on it with the aid of spiders' well. However, old Dumari looked down on the watery marshy waste and pondered over it. He considered what he could do with it. Could it be left permanently as a waste? Could it not be turned into a useful, purposeful, purposeful spot? Could this great wet monotony not be populated by divinities and other living things? A plan then emerged when Ola Dumari decided to form the watery marshes with monotony into a solid earth. But did he, in his almightiness, need go to the spot himself to do the work? No. And so, in doing the work, he summoned Orise Inle and commissioned him. They gave Orise Inle the material of a leaf packing of loose earth or a small or a snail shell full of sand and for his tool he was given a white hen and a pigeon to spread the earth. Acting on the instruction of Olu Dumari, Orise Inle descended upon the watery waste. On getting to a particular spot on the watery marshy board, he poured out the loose earth and dropped the birds where he had thrown the sand. The birds began immediately to scratch at the sand and scatter it on the marshy waste. And wherever the earth was scattered became dry land. However, the loose earth was scattered unevenly, and there emerged hills, valleys, and mountains. When this first phase of creation was completed, Ola Dumare instructed Balaam, also known as his inspector of work, the chameleon, to go and inspect the work, which Orise Hinle had early reported to Ola Dumare. It was completed after two visits to the spot the chameleon reported back that Orise Hinle's work was perfect enough for further operations. <clears throat> he said Orise Inlay was again commissioned to equip the earth. The birds were to increase and multiply and serve as food. Certain trees were to be planted to supply drinks. Furthermore, man called Ori Luri, he had a part of being created for the purpose of inhabiting the earth and came down to the newly created side of the earth. This was the beginning of human occupation of the earth. People began to increase and multiply. But they did not have enough water for use. Orise Inle therefore was a, a peer for more water. And Ola Dumare sent rain. And Orise Inle was further convinced to mold man's physical parts from the dust of the earth. 
he could have him do this according as he liked it. That is to say that he could make human fingers perfect or defective, white or black, shaped or deformed, but it will to my race. Provided an absolute concern to make the physical form a living being by putting it in the essence of being a life. On one occasion, Orise Inle tried to spot Odo Dumare at work to know how the life his form became living being. Odo Dumare saw this conspiracy and forestalled him by making him fall into a deep sleep, only to wake and find all the form in the stock become human being. From the beginning, the created order enjoyed what was good, and there was harmony and uninterrupted relationship, communion, and fellowship between man in the spiritual world. Tradition had it that the sky, heaven was so close to earth that men could touch it. People usually were allowed to travel together to ask them whatever they needed soon. Something happened, and a barrier was immediately raised between heaven and earth. The sky ever moved far away, man was no longer open to the free intercourse with heaven. What happened is variously told. Some tradition had it that a woman with a dirty hand touched the face of heaven. Others say that a man misbehaved in heaven, having helped himself with too much food. Whatever may be the version of what actually happened, one thing is definite about the motive of all the stories, namely that man sinned and that the hereto bliss of heaven disappeared. The one-time garden of Eden was Ephesus. Man's total way of being was disrupted. It should be pointed out that some tradition attribute creation work to Odudu, to Odu the way, who is widely acknowledged as a great uh, progenitor of Yaruba land. In many West African creation stories, the arch divinity usually comes into action. It is, therefore, more fitting to regard or reset inlay as the creative agent rather than Odu Duwe, whom some people would not accept to be one of the earlier divinity, but rather classify him, classify as one of the ancestors. Now that's the Yaruba. It's the now B is the Igbo. The Igbo do not have any systemic account of the creation of the world as we have among the Yaruba. But in the light of the ancient beliefs, custom practice and tradition of the Igbo, which sometimes are found in fossilized states and old words, old proverbs, and old idioms, the Igbo had to believe that the world and the fullness thereof were created by the supreme god, Chukwu, or Chiniki. The most detailed version of this belief is found among the Enra of Aupe. According to their myth, in the beginning, Chukwu created the first man who was a superhuman, being. His name was Era or Enra. Chuck Wu then sent down Enra, who mysteriously descended upon the earth from heaven and landed at Aguliri or Inuku Oku. When Enra got down, he found that the earth was waterlogged and unfit for habitation. He therefore appealed to Chuck Wu, who immediately sent down an okay blacksmith. The blacksmith blew on the waterlogged earth with his bellows and it became dry land. Later, Enri married and multiplied. In Inui, people also have a myth of creation. They say that living in the heavens with Chuck Wu were some primordial beings who were not only inferior in rank and status to Chuck Wu, but they were also his messengers who carried out some minor jobs under the instruction and direction of Chuck Wu. One of the most pre prominent and the most beloved of these primordial beings Beings was Edo, a female divinity. She was believed to be a special favorite of Chuck Wu, who loved her because she was. Because she was very industrious, full of initiative and diligence. Because of these admirable qualities in Edo, Chuck Wu gave her the special privilege of his staff of office, a piece of his long scepter which was made of inzu, white chalk, and also a small clay pot of water. With these materials, the inzu, or walk, or white chalk, and the water in, in a small clay pot, Edo was sent out by Chukwu to go and survey the firmament. But unfortunately, Edo's adventurous spirit carried her beyond the firmament, 
lost beyond the firmament, he though began to grind and spray the white chalk all over the place. These sprays solidified and formed land. This was how Edo made land with chalk with white chalk. But the rest of the white chalk Edo broke into four pieces and put into the white into the water pot. Presently, chalk would found Edo tired and lonely on the land that she formed with chalk with white chalk. Chuck would took pity on Edo and promised to give her some uh, to give her some companions to talk to, send on errands and do her service. So Chuck would took took the water pot in which the broken piece of chalk worked. He put his right hand into the pot and took out the first piece of white chalk and called it Otolo, meaning the first son. He took out the second lump and called it Ure, Uregu. Uruago, the, the second son, the third, Yumudim, third son, the fourth, Aichi, Aichi, the last son. Then Chuck Wu blew some breath out of his mouth on them, and the force of the breath shook the four images, and they began to move and talk and behave. Then Edo told them, I am the mother of you all in Enwa, and this land on which you are walking is Enaidu, Edo. That is my prize for Chukwu, because the Inzu with which you are made and with which, are, which the land is made is special gift and privilege for Chukwu. So these four sons are the four villages which make up in Inwe, Inwe, town, and Aina Edo is their common heritage and mother of all in Inwe. So these four sons, Otolo, Yuruogo, Yumudem, and Echa, grew into men and went to Aero Chukwu and took four beautiful sisters and married them. Today, in in, in, in we, Edo is the greatest divinity and her worship transcends all other foreign religious practices. The Edo cult is firmly rooted and observed by all Christian traditionists and all. The Edo festival is observed in two ways, one by the women every seven years and another by the men every nine years. During this great festival, all sons and daughters of Aina Edo come home to celebrate the equal Eru Edo, Edo, meaning rededication of body and soul to Edo. The venue of this great festival is at Nakuo Edo, the square old spot where Edo first landed. This equal Eru Edo is a week-long festival and during that period the whole town is in the gayest festival mode. Other versions of this creation story exist among other Igbo groups, especially in Orlu, where the role which Enra occupied is occupied by Ame Igbo. Here, the people believe that it is from Ame Igbo that their founding ancestors dispersed. Also, the earth goddess Ale is believed to have derived from Ale, Ame Igbo. Ale is the arch divinity of Igbo land. Here, as among the Yaruba, she is associated with the act of creation and can be described as a, as a creatureist. Just as the Yaruba have Ike as their sacred city where creation began, so do the Igbo have Enra, Ake, and Ame Igbo and Orlu as their own spiritual and ideological headquarters or metropolis. The centers from which their various branches dispersed to their present location also in route okay as a spiritual and dispersal center is very important for many Igbo people and their special sacrifice and ritual rites are performed on special occasions. However, whichever place the Igbo clan groups may have traced their ancestral order, the basic principle is one, and that is that the creative activity or creation is of the very essence of the divine being. That is why they refer to God as Oye Okaiki, the person who created. Chukwu Okaiki, God the Creator. Easy Sateoki, the king that creates. Or simply Chaniki, the spirit that creates. So that's, that was the Igbo.
of time permit, I'm, I won't be able to read every group in West Africa. But uh, okay, we read the uh, the Yoruba and the Igbo. The, uh, the D, the Edo, more of the Edo, because it's not that very long, it's not that very long. Uh, okay, it says in Edo, cosmological account, two divinities are mentioned Ose No Way and Ose No Way. The first controlled the house or the township, while the second ruled over the bush. Ose no way was commissioned by Ose, Ose no Buwe to create man, while Ose no he was delegated to create animals of the bush. Soon Ose no he became restive, and he was jealous of Ose no way. He planned to destroy his work. In doing this, he built a house and stored all kinds of diseases therein. The time came when all the men and women created by Ose no way were coming down to earth, and Ose no he caused rain to fall. The people on their way got to the house in which the diseases were concealed, and they were forced to take shelter in it. In this way, the people carried various diseases to the world. Ose Noe was angry because of what, because of what Ose Noe had done. He retaliated by making animals created by Ose Noe, the enemies of men. Thus, men started to kill and eat animals. Here again, we have everything traced to God. That the two divinities serve as the agents of creation, derived from the source being and seeing their names, which have Ose as the prefix. The name simply subordinate Ose. In other words, they are the sources of being which are inferior in rank, value, power, importance, authority, and position to great to the great source being. They are subject to the authority of the great Ose, and they cannot stand alone. Now that's the Edo. Now this is the Iwi and the Plum. E, the name of God among the Iwi speaking peoples in Nene, Buluku, the ancient deity. This deity is androgynous. He is both male and female, both male and female. Nene, Buluku had two children, twins named Mewu and Lise. When Nene Buluku had created the world. The man over the realm was ceded to his two children. Mewu, the female, ruled the night. And like, and like say, the male had control over the day. Thus, Mewu is the moon, and she inhabits the west, while Lysay is the sun and inhabits the east. Although, Nene Baluku had set everything in motion by himself. He used the arch divinity. Mabel prayed with Lysa as an agent of creation, but at the time, the means were assigned to them. No children had yet been born to the prayer. Eventually, Mabel and Lysa gave birth to 14 children in all. The three elders, St. Bete, Sagbo, and Agni, became the founders of Pantheons. The gist of this myth is that the world and the divinities came into being in consequence of the supreme deity. Okay. Now, this is the story. This is the Akan, the story about Akan. Like some other West African people, the Akan do not possess a systemic account of the creation of things. Some of the explanations given lead to contradiction. Here we can consider the order of creation deduced from various accounts. In the beginning, God made the sky. Then he made the earth, rivers, waters, plants, and trees. This was followed by the creation of the first man and woman. Then God made animals for man's use. The animals were to eat plants, but man was to use everything created by God. One legend said that the man was called Okanian. 
and the moon was gone. Kayiwe. They lived in a cave and were taught by Inyami, the names of all things we had created. In different parts of the Kayan land, we have sacred spots where the original ancestors are said to have been created by God. One important fact we must realize about these varied accounts is that it is universally acknowledged that Inyami, the supreme deity, was the creator of all things. That is why, as the author of all things, I can call him Odu Mekome. His title, Bori Bori, meaning excavator, hewer, carver, creator, originator, inventor, or architect, so that the people hold firmly, definitively, and unequivocally that it was God alone who created the world. The divinities are called the children of Iyami, signifying that they derive their origin from the Supreme Being. One drawing stands near supports to the belief that God was creator. Odu Mankome, he created the thing. Pure out creator, he created the thing. What did he create? He created order. He created knowledge. He created death as his quintessence. Quintessence. Uh, so that's the king. And uh, what I'm going to read now is the man D. The man D have it that in the beginning, in Gibo, the Supreme Being created the earth and all the things in it. The way this was done is not known. However, God crowned the work of creation by making a man and a woman. The couple did not know his name, but in Gibo told them that they should ask for anything they wanted from him. And so each time they needed anything they wanted to tell in Gibo, and he would give it to them. But their requests were so frequent. It gave Ingibo much concern. He thought that they would wear him out with their request. Therefore, one night, when the people were sleeping, Ingibo moved far away from them. In the morning, they could not see Ingibo, but when they looked up, they saw him spread out very big. For that, they said, Ingibo long Inge Wali, take it widespread great ears. It is from this we have Ingibo way, meaning great God. And Gibo then gave each of them a foul and instructed them to call on him any time one of them did wrong to his companion. He also told them that whenever he came, they should return his foul to him when he came down to them one. One day, he warned them to grab each other no matter and told them that they should keep the peace with each other. And Gibo then went away. From that time, the people called him Levi, meaning up or high. Here again, we have an attempt to tell the origin of things and the reason for the sky, heaven being removed far away. And the last one I'm going to read uh, in this book is, is the Kono. The Kono speak of Yete, the supreme God, as the creator, although there is no, there is no systemic account of his creative activity. However, they hold that God created the first man and woman who had a male child. The three were told by Yete that they would live forever and that when their bodies grew old, he would give them new skin to become young again. When the people became old, Yete sent new skin wrapped in a package to them. Three dogs on the way, the dogs saw other animals feasting and he dropped the package and joined in the general Come be an One of the animals questioned him on the package, and he revealed the whole story of the new skin. The snake, who overheard the story, stepped the step he stole the package, carried it home, and shared the new skin with other snakes. Yate was annoyed because of the treachery of the snake, and he commanded that the snake would henceforth live by himself in the bush. Man therefore became the enemy of the snake, and since then. Man has always tried to kill snakes wherever he finds one. However, because man did not have the new skin, he must die when he grows old. This account also offers an explanation about the appearance of death in the world. So these are some of the stories that in African traditional religion, the many groups of people in West Africa include uh, the Bantu and Bantu land. So these are the accounts of 
of uh, what we refer to as the creation story, just similar to the story that you find in uh, the King James Version of the Bible, what they refer to uh, the Book of Moses. Uh, you know, five books on the Moses, uh, his five books. So the you know uh, the story, the creation stories in in, in uh, the West African tradition. What I'm looking at, that's all. I'm trying to see how much time we got. I'm still in the same book. And uh, there's a part, there's a section here. Uh, this is uh, it's titled Man's Origin. Man's Origin. It's in chapter 6. general concept of the nature of man and his link with God. It said, our study so far has shown that man is in close relationship with God. Essentially, there are three ways by which man is related to God. First, the creation of man according to the origin. This is God's work. Although he can delegate other spiritual agents to perform it. Secondly, man is related to God in consequence of the essence of being which can only be put in man by the supreme deity. This can be seen clearly in the Yahweh creation story. And third, man's destiny shows that he is related to his maker because, as we shall see, presently it is the supreme being that seals the destiny of man. We thus see the relationship between God and man, and we find that man, before his birth, and his birth, throughout life, and his death, and in his death is inseparable, is inseparable from God and closely related to him. But one may ask the question, what is man? This question can be answered variously depending on the point of view of the person answering it, generally speaking. However, a West African man may answer the question by saying that man is the most important of the creatures of God, and he is composed of the material and the immaterial part. The material part is that which is tangible, visible, and can be described in concrete terms. This, in fact, is the body. Any part of the body can be lost without the loss of life. A damaged part can be cured or replaced, and man continues in existence. But this is not the same when we come to the second part for man. 
which is the immaterial, the intangible, and the invisible entity. This entity can indeed be related to the vital principle. Man, its presence or absence in man indicates the existence or death of man. In other words, and unlike the physical form of man, when this vital principle is lost in man, it cannot be regained. And the whole man, both the material and the immaterial, is lost. In consequence of this indisputable fact, we shall concentrate attention on this aspect of human entity and regard it as the main essence of man that which makes him a living being, apart from which he is not a living being, attempts to describe and define this essence of man's being that various scholars have led inevitably to fantastic theorizations, absurd, absurd analysis, and spurious imagination. We can, however, make no pretense of, re of realizing the fact of the complexity of West Africa ideas about this essence of man's being. There are people, peoples in West Africa who can speak of more than two distinguish, distinguishable spiritual forces in man. And this fact will be brought out clearly as we examine the belief of each people. But even then, it is generally held that, among other things, man possesses a kind of trans transcendental self which, though invisible, is real. It is a kind of spiritual nature which no West African people doubt. See, each people has a definite term for this human essence, although details about it vary considerably for our purpose and for want of a more subtle, more comprehensive, and more universally acceptable term. We shall adopt the term personality, soul, to describe this human essence or transcendental self, some would call it over soul, ego, or soul stuff. We should take these terms to mean the same thing as the personality soul. According to the oral tradition, the personality soul derived directly from the Supreme Being. It is this personality soul that really makes a person whatever he is. It accounts for the peculiar characteristic of the individual. Indeed, it is the ruler of the individual. It serves as man's double or guardian angel who is associated with him from birth to warn and help him through this life and guide his fortunes as a superior entity to the whole man. It is appealed to for protection so that the evil before man can be expelled and the evil behind him can be removed. We can further say that it is the personality soul that animates the body, gives vitality to it, and pervades it with, with life. In this way, it plays the part of vital principle, and it is closely associated with breathing, for this is clearly an, an accompaniment we shall now examine this circumstantial detail of the concept of the person that is so among some people. So like I said, that was, uh, that was some of the uh, creation stories.
and some of the other information about the origin of man. And Dr. Uh, Joseph, I'm going to say, hey, when they look, uh, he had a Lumo Dopingo. Now we're going to uh, read Dr. Joseph SMB's book. Dr. Joseph SMB, Dr. Joseph SMB. This book here is written by Dr. John S. M. B. Concepts of God in Africa. Dr. John S. M. B. We're going to go to chapter 4. God and man. We started at 14. The creation of the original state of man. Says here the creation of real estate of man. Say almost every African people has one or more creation stories. The concepts pertain to these myths and cover a wide range, and it is helping to group and consider them under different headings. The creation of man in relation to that of other things. According to many stories, the creation of man is placed at or towards the end of the creation of all things. I have not come across any myth which places man as the first or earliest creature. These stories point out also that man was created as husband and wife, and they don't want them get the names of the first human being. In the Abelunia story, it is told that God created man so that the sun would have someone for whom to shine. Afterwards, he created plants, animals, and birds to provide food for man. The first man was called Enwembu, and his wife, Sile whom God created so that man would have someone for whom to talk to. In the Bugusu version, the man is known as Umungu Gome and the woman as Melewa Maleba. The Bambuti narrate that, that God created the earth and the heavens, his storm which was below, then water, tree, man, and animal. The men were young, Man called Mook and his wife Utah. In another version, these two originated or came from God and people of the world, starting with the females themselves. In the Banyan Wonder story, the first man is known as Kajakam Mentu, a name which means the rule of men. He begot three sons, Katetsu, Gahetsu, and Gatwin. We now represent the three racial social classes in the country. The Kayundi believe that God placed one man and one woman upon the earth. In the beginning, in the Basse, they so gave some of creation, which we have already quoted in full on page 46. God is 
rivers in his cream, the first man, and given him a wife in order that she may bear children. He blesses the earth in which men live. The Lozai narrates that the first man, Kimundu, was created after all. Other things had, had been created and that God was then still on the earth when he formed different peoples with, with different customs, languages, and manners. The new Bible tell us that in his transcendent aspect, God created the first men long, long ago and put them on earth. They were called Jubal Rock Bora, which means first coming from the sky. And Mimi, which means the person who came along, they bore a son. And they doubt who in turn will marry a female children. And, and so mankind increased upon the earth. In the men be story, he is narrating that God made all things first, and afterwards he created men, both husband and wife. According to the Miru, God made first a boy, but since he had nobody else with whom to play, he told God that he was not satisfied. So a girl. So a girl came out. They painted together, and similar stories told among the Nanda that God made a small man child and saw someone with whom this man, this man child would live. The story goes on to say, and he killed. He said, and he killed, put to sleep that man, and took out one of his ribs. From which he made a girl who drew up, who grew up and bore children. But this act of bearing children annoyed God, who then told the temple, I have grown, I have given you, I have given you death and help, and said, Go. The Zulus have several versions of their creation myth, but accordingly, the husband appeared first, followed by the wife. Men sprang God. As if he had made them. Because he existed before them, God begat men. He gave them being. He begat them. So I'm saying that God split his stone into two. And out came the first men. Others say that men came out of a bed of a reed. Where we had our origin. This bed swelled and when it had burst, they came out. And, after, and afterwards, came count the other animals. According to the Zulu, the first men came out as complete and perfected beings. And I'm not going to read too much more because time forbidden. Uh, I'm going to stop right there because we can always come back to the next video. But like I said, we, were, we read some uh, information that was in what they call the Holy Bible. And there was an Afro-Asiatic uh, version, you understand? But, uh, but they refer to it as the creation story. So that was their viewpoint about you know, being being on this planet and about being on the other subject. But uh, Read from Dr. John SMB, Concepts of God in Africa, and read from Dr. Uh, Joseph Oma St. Abel Lehman's book that he co wrote with Dr. P. Adenome, the painter. Uh, you should gain more and more uh, insight about African traditional religion. So, like I said, on that note, we're going to go ahead and end today's video. And we're going to come back, uh, you know, in the, in the very near future. And we're going to continue to talk about African traditional religion. We're going to continue to talk about African traditional religion. And uh, again, my name is Eric D. Johnson. I'm from Bright Shine. I live right here in the city of Memphis. 
Then the state of Tennessee is in a county shell. Thank all my fans, my support for them continue to encourage me and support. Until my next video, take care of yourself. I wish each and every one of you the very best.